We see people entering the room right at the top of the hour. I um, will give folks just a, a minute or so. I was about to say at the lunch hour, but I'm coming to all of us uh, today from Colorado, where it is. It is the lunch hour. Um, so welcome, uh, welcome to our colleagues, to our guests, uh, to our avid readers. I will put us all in the category of avid readers, or at least avid book talk participants. Um, I am Allison Griffin. I am a senior vice president with Whiteboard Advisors. We are a social impact agency working in the education space, um, and I have the pleasure of leading, uh, co-leading our post-secondary education practice and a lot of our work that comes out of the state of Colorado. Um, during the pandemic, we actually started a book talk series as a way to connect not just with each other, but to actually connect with authors who are writing about issues at the intersection of education and workforce, um, and to also create a book list um, for many of our followers. And I think over the course of three years, um, I have read close to 30 books um, from our colleagues across the country. Not I have not had the pleasure of talking with all 30 authors, but um, we host an occasional book talk, hopefully every month, at least every quarter, uh, to bring our followers together with authors who are producing some pretty magnificent work. And so today um, I have the incredible pleasure of talking with Dr. Paul LeBlanc. Um, many of you who have joined us today um, know Paul as the president of Southern New Hampshire University. I, um, I frequently say that, uh, Paul, you and the institution almost are just synonymous. Um, oh. You have such an incredible presence and way of connecting uh, with your campus community, with your learners. Um, and I think that uh, you have you've set a, a new bar for the way that uh, higher education leadership interacts uh, with the campus community. I've, I've looked to you for many years uh, in the way that you you engage uh, oh, with learners, all backgrounds. So while you are, are very well known um, across your work in the post-secondary education space, particularly um, advocating for and supporting our adult learners or learners who are coming to post-secondary education uh, for the very first time, today we're going to talk, um, we're going to take our conversation a little broader than higher ed, and we're going to talk about your most recent book um, called Broken, and we will get into that um, in a, a little bit more detail and what prompted you to um, use your, your own personal experience, but also the experience that you've had in post-secondary education to really uh, drive the storytelling um, in, in your mm -hmm. latest book. Um, I will say to those who have joined us today, um, we are uh, hosting this as a webinar. Um, we will not be able to see you on screen, but we will be able to see your questions and, and, and answers and chat. Um, I would encourage you, um, if you have a question for Paul over the course of our conversation, please don't hesitate to put it in the Q&A, um, and I will work to intermingle your questions with the questions that I have for Paul, and um, we won't leave today without the opportunity to engage with the audience. So thank you all for joining us. We're just going to jump right in. How's that sound? Allison, thank you so much. You're so kind. I'm really, it's a pleasure. We've known each other for a long time. We're really fun to, to be doing this book talk with you and lots of friends at Whiteboard Advisors. Absolutely. Well, thank you for saying yes. And, um, you know, when when you and I, I think, first connected, Paul, we, we've we been talking about issues around innovative finance and new ways to support our learners as they are um, advancing through their, their education pathway. And one of the things that struck me um, as I reflected on that early work together um, it was a signal to me that some of our systems are broken and not just in the education and workforce context, but our higher education institutions have essentially become the social safety net for many in our communities. And so with that, um, you know, while many would expect you to focus um, your latest book on perhaps your journey through higher education and your influence in that space, um, you actually you actually spent a fair amount of time at a much broader scale um, in broken across many industries. 
Can you talk a little it bit did. more about that? Yeah. So Allison, probably perhaps in a reflection of my abject lack of social life during the pandemic, I actually wrote two books. And the first book was called Students First. And that book was really about rethinking our systems of higher ed. So really looking about CBE as an alternative to time-based models of education, which is essentially most of the higher education, and how we think assessment and how we'd have to think about differently about federal financial aid. And I wrote that book for the Harvard Ed Press. And it was due on, let's say, January 1st. And sometime around November, I really was stalled. And, and you know, you write lots of people listening on this call. And, and you know, like you just, it just felt like I had gotten into a slog. And I realized I was grappling with a question that didn't fit in the book. And the book was about system redesign. But the question that I was grappling with, that was just kind of like sitting here at, in the study. Up, um, here We have this old house on the coast of Maine that we escape to sometimes. And I wrote most of that book here. And I, I kept thinking, why is it that higher education, I, I'll tell you the question I wrote my wife had as someone started on again, response. I said, do you think that there'll be a point when higher education learns to love its students again? And she said, well, did it ever? And I said, honestly, I don't know, but I know I felt loved when I went to college as a first generation immigrant with amazing mentors and a non-status institution, a state college and, and not the flagship R1. And I'm still in touch with some of those faculty. And, and I feel like higher ed was, has lost its way in terms of its centeredness, its love of the students, the people we serve. And then I asked this question, like, there are lots of systems that I think routinely dehumanize the people they're supposed to lift up. Mm -hmm. I think K-12, I was very influenced very as a young, young academic by Jonathan Kozel's book, Death at an Early Age, which I think is still a seminal book in my thinking, yes, but, yes. but certainly K-12. Um, and then uh, certainly healthcare. I mean, almost anyone who's been subjected to the American system of healthcare has had dehumanizing experiences, maybe starting with that paper Johnny, like let's start there and go from there. Um, and then I, you know, and I was thinking about um, mental health treatment, we have completely disassembled. So what we have now is essentially prisons, from what I can tell. Uh, and criminal justice doesn't even pretend anymore to try to humanize. So if you read, as I did, the mission statements of all 50 correctional systems in the country, they all say a whole lot about um, redemption and reentry and bringing people back into society. And yet a system like California spends 1% on those efforts. So, so I set out on this journey to ask, to like go into those fields and find people who are rethinking the systems. We've been trying to rethink higher ed in many ways at SNHU and lots of our colleagues at other good institutions that are doing the same. Um, so I, I said I interviewed these amazing innovators in healthcare and mental health in K-12 and substance abuse treatment. And, and there was a thread that ran through it. And then I layered in interviews with people like Jessica Benjamin, the noted psychologist, feminist psychologist at NYU, and Greg Elliott, who had huge influence on me, a sociologist at Brown, and, and Matt Steinfeld at Yale. And they gave me the theory and the ways of thinking about what am I seeing? Like, what are all these innovators arriving at? And that, that led to the book. And it led to this notion that wasn't a book about high, why higher ed is broken, how we can fix it, it became how our social systems are failing us and how we can fix them. Absolutely. So, oh, so you... by the way, let me just finish because you're not ready. Yes. Yes. So remember, I call my editor at Harvard Ed Press and say, I have good news and bad news because I started answering the question. Like I was like, why is it? And a friend of mine said, answer the question. And I couldn't stop writing. And I wrote here some days for 14 hours. My wife would bring me a cup of tea and a power bar. I just, and it wasn't the writing that leaves you exhausted. It was the writing that got me up at four o'clock the next morning because I had more to say, more to say, more to say, more to say. Right. And so I come here so the good news and bad news. The good news is I'm writing like crazy. The bad news is I'm not writing your book. Um, <laughs> so I ran through and I, read, I, read, I did a full first draft on Broken and then put it aside. And then the rest of Students First came like that. Like it just flowed. But I had to get this question out of my psyche for a little bit. Yes. Oh my gosh. So two books. So we'll have to have you back. We'll have oh, no, no, sorry. Oh yeah. Oh <laughs> no, no. Well, honestly, as it sounded. No, I love that. Um, so you talked about social systems for those who have not read the book. So the book talk is also a little bit of the old cliff notes version, yes. right? It's to, to get folks hooked and hopefully go out and buy the book today yep. for some weekend reading. 
Um, but can you talk a little bit more, you know, in the book, you talk about these different social systems. Can you define that um, for, from, in the context of your research and writing? You mentioned a few of them, but can you talk about the social systems that you um, really highlighted throughout Broken? Yeah, and I was trying to think about this as sort of social systems of care. That is, what are these sort of systems that all societies have that essentially are built to lift people up, to transform in some fashion? So K-12 is a social system of care that seeks to lift young people up and transform their lives through education, public and now increasingly private in the U.S. K-12 certainly, right, is a lifting of the intellect, of you know, coming of age, all the things that higher ed does. Healthcare, um, in a much more sort of pragmatic way, like literally transforming your health, getting you from ill health to, to, to good health. Substance abuse, yes. powerfully transformative. Theoretically, in a healthy system of criminal justice or incarceration, we would have transformation. So these are these big systems yeah. that are often funded with taxpayer support. Right. Uh, in our system, public-private, so insurance companies, but third-party payers are generally engaged in it. Um, and, and those are the systems I was really interesting, interested in because they're the systems that actually speak and fuel most directly the health of the society at large. So the question one might ask of an individual, why does anyone, why might one of these systems dehumanize the very people they serve, um, is in some ways the question you could then ask of a society. Is this a society that, that lifts everyone up or is it a society that dehumanizes many of the people that the society should be supporting and, and serving? Absolutely. So it's so, a big question. It's not a small question. <laughs> yeah. No, not a small question, a, a significant question. And I imagine that you found similarities between these different social systems, um, both in the way that they may dehumanize us, but maybe also in the opportunity um, yeah. that presents itself for doing things differently. What, so, um, let's, I, let's, let's go on the high, the high side, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Where, yeah, where do you see opportunity? Um, so the opportunity comes, and it really was the fundamental discovery for me in the book around scale. So when we think of scale, particularly in a kind of late stage capitalism, technology driven society like the one we're in, particularly sort of post Ronald Reagan, right, in which we came to start to think about efficiency and productivity, uh, you know, in a kind of Taylorism modernized, we started to think about these things. And oftentimes what they meant was, let's measure Right. Let's reproducible, uh, replicable processes, um, really understanding at, at a high level of detail how a thing works, our procedure works. And let's sort of drive the inefficiencies. And those are often human. Let's drive the human quite often as out of it as much as possible, because that's hard to measure. It's messy. It clouds our ability to measure efficacy. However, we come to do that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And and. So you see the deployment of technology as a, okay, let's get that messy human stuff out because that's expensive and, and often gets in the way. Right. Uh, here's the problem is that all of these innovators who are doing unbelievably good work, like addictions, you know, companies that do addiction uh, recovery with two to three times better results than the norm, uh, a healthcare system like uh, Aora, which has changed names two more times, but the one I described in the book, we're really doing remarkable results and driving down the cost of healthcare. But all of them flip the script. So what they ask instead is, what are the human relationships that are most important in transforming lives? So lesson one, you can't actually transform lives if you're not in relationship, human relationship with them. So if anyone listening to this were to ask, like, who are the most powerful transformative, what are the, what are the most powerful transformative things that sort of shaped your success? No one's going to cite, by and large, a program, system, a technology. They're going to cite a person, right? There's this wonderful woman who I didn't have in my, on my radio screen before the book who writes about this, about extreme poverty. She's like, anyone who's been lifted out of poverty never cites a program. They never say, oh, it was that program that changed my way, right? They always cite someone who believed in them, who saw them, who made them feel like they matter. We can talk about mattering and, and Greg yeah. Elliott's work in this space. But what Jessica Benjamin or Matt Steinfeld would say is that you can't actually change a life if you are not in relationship with someone. Absolutely. Um, 
And, and that's what all of these innovators are doing in scaled systems. Because we often think, wait a minute, that's not very scalable. They say, no, it actually is. But what you have to do is you have to create, you have to understand what relationships are most important, what characterizes those relationships, and then create the space and hold that ground sacred and then automate the hell out of everything else, right? And let me give you just a real example that's painfully close to home because SNHU is built to some extent on that model. Like, you know, most universities will talk first about their academic programs. We will talk first about our coaching model. We planted our flag on the relationship of advisors. We call them academic advisors, but in many ways, they're life coaches. And they're with you through your journey. I could read you emails I got as early, recently as today from graduates talking about how their coach got them across the finish line. Um, and they talk often, by the way, in terms of transform my life or save my life is a phrase I have to use. So we, so we do this, right? I think we're really good at this. And we deploy technology to support those human reactions. They have powerful CRM, et cetera, et cetera. I was talking to a group of advisors, and I've just read David Graeber's book, Bullshit Jobs. I don't know if you know this book. I do know, says, this book. know Basically, globally, something like 60% of people think their jobs are going away tomorrow, and no one would notice. And then for those who, and in America, it's less. It's like 35%. But those who, in their jobs, talk about what portion of their job actually serves the system as opposed to the people they want to serve. And when I asked advisors this, it pained me when they told me the things SNHU asked them to do with their day that has nothing to do with improving their students' experience. I was like, give me examples. Right. And an example would be the process by which we make them get approval for PTO. Okay. It's a small it's like, and it doesn't do anything for them or their students. It's just about our tracking systems. And you would say, well, of course you need good tracking systems. But the point that I want to make in this, and I'll start, I'll stop. But in all of these innovators, they're starting with the human, they automate everything else so you can make more and more time for the relationships that are most important and impactful, and as a result, get better outcomes. So we have a, a K-12 public system that is huge. Um, we, we spend a lot and the outcomes are terrible. We have, a pub, we have a healthcare system that spends more per capita than any place in the world. And if you are the luck, in the lucky portion of that system with privilege, you do fine. You want to be nowhere else. Right. But for most of society, it's actually quite a failure. And if you take a look at it, it's really in some ways this problem about what, what getting backwards the question about what you have to, what you do with human relationships. Absolutely. I, that resonates with me um, so deeply uh, thinking about not just putting the learner at the center, but putting all of our relationships with one another at the center. And I think it goes to the heart of something that you, you talked a, a good deal about in the book and you just mentioned it is this idea of mattering. So yes. what, I, I mean, we could all glean what you mean by that, but can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by mattering and why does it play such an important role in social systems? And perhaps you could give us another example um, of where you saw mattering really being a, a change agent. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's really, in some ways, a chapter that, I don't know if you could say this about your own writing, but I love that chapter so much because I love Greg Elliott's work so much. So Greg Elliott is a sociologist at Brown. He's pretty much a good friend. And Greg uh, set out in his career as, as a young researcher at the University of Wisconsin, right? Perhaps the preeminent social work, uh, sociology program in the country, to ask the answer the question, why do young people join gangs? It's dangerous. You know how it ends usually. It's not good but they join gangs. Why do they join gangs? And he said, if you know, if a young man or woman, but mostly young men, you know, wakes up in a house that's got no heat and no one's there making sure there's a hot, you know, hot breakfast on the table or any breakfast on the table, and no one's paying attention to whether his clothes are clean or not, he, can't he cannot conclude that he matters very much to whoever runs that household. And then he walks to school where the heat is inadequate and there's mold on the walls and the books haven't been replaced in 40 years and a overworked, dispirited teacher barely remembers his name. Um, he can't feel like he matters very much to the system. And then if he walks home along streets where every encounter with authority is one that treats him as subhuman in some fashion or not worthy of respect, he can't feel like he matters very much 
Mm -hmm. um, so when a gang comes along and says, if you join this gang, we'll kill for you. That's how much you matter. And Greg would point out, mattering is a two-way street, and we have expectations of you. Mm -hmm. So when we have low expectations of students, I'm going to digress for one second, what's part of the message there is we don't actually, you don't matter very much to us. Like we don't think very much of you, we don't invest in you. We have the poverty of expectation as a debilitating thing. So gangs are really powerful in that respect. And, you know, the friend, the Algerian sociologist, Franz Fanon, were listing books that were influential in your life. One of mine was The Wretched of the Earth. Yeah. And also um, Richard Wright's Native Son in both those books. From a sociological perspective and then from a literary perspective and i'll give you a third camus the stranger and all three of those books the authors describe when you make people feel like they don't matter long enough they will assert their existence and they'll often do it in violent ways so if you remember the stranger and native son both end with a murder and do you remember the wish of the stranger in camus book who says his fondest hope for his execution is that there will be huge crowds of people howling for his end. Because That's why? Cool. He'll know that he mattered. Negatively, but he mattered. So, so that book became, and and I think, you know, I was talking, one of the interviews with Matt Beale, Matt is the um, head of child and adolescent psychology at Georgetown's MedStar Center, just got a dive chair there. And I asked him about this, and he, and he and was, the question was, why is it that some kids survive terrible circumstances when so many others don't? What is the nature of that resiliency? And he said it usually requires three things, but one dominates. One is that you have some passion, something that you can hook into, music, basketball, fat, whatever it is, but something that can be hooked onto, yes. um, that can spark engagement. A second one is that ideally they have one year of normal in their background so that they know this really crappy situation they're in is not normal. Otherwise, you you just internalize this as this is what the norm looks like. And if you haven't experienced it for one year in your past, you've at least seen it in a way that you can imagine a world better than the one you're in. You can either experience a world better or at least you can imagine. But number three is the most important one, that you have one person that believes in you. It's a relationship question, right? That you matter, that you're yes. better than this. And actually leads sort of the second chapter of the book, which is on aspiration. Mm -hmm. So it's not just that you matter to me, but that I can help you dream a bigger dream that you might not even know is available to you. So when I was, you know, I grew up at pretty much, I was going to say poor, not desperately poor, but very modest circumstances. We immigrated. My mom worked in a factory until she was in her 70s. I talk about this in the book. Um, no one in my neighborhood went to college. And it was a sixth grade teacher who said to my mother one day, and she carried this to her deathbed. You know, she was, it was like a lightning bolt. Um, Paul could go to college someday. He's college, but he's some phrase, like he's college material. He didn't use that exactly. It's something out of fact. And, you know, and she cleaned houses on the weekends in very wealthy homes in the suburbs of Boston where their kids went to college, but no one in our family went to college. So I was the first of the youngest of five. And then it was a teacher in high school who took me under her wing and who sort of took that notion and really kind of made it a reality. But it was someone who believed in me and then gave me a dream bigger than the one I had in hand. Yes. And this goes back to this question I said, we said earlier, right? Like, no one is lifted out of poverty, for example, mm -hmm. uh, and cites a program. They cite someone who believed in them. And yes. if you, I really have lots of problems with J.D. Vance uh, politically, <laughs> and I hate that book. An uh, another book talk for another day. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, there's a guy who never took a sociology class from what I can tell. But if you remember, one of the things I really liked about that book, and I feel like we had some overlapping experiences in our lives and our upbringing, was if you remember, if you read it, his grandmother was the one who believed in him. That, you know, as he described Hillbilly, he used his phrase on mine, who was, you know, hard drinking, salty tongue, gun toting, crazy, right. but always said to him, you're better than this. And he believed her her dream, right? He adopted her dream. Mm -hmm. That notion of mattering in the industries we're talking about take lots of forms. And I want to come back. You said something really important in passing, but I think you're the first person to put their finger on it uh, almost fully. But but you said, give me an example outside. Uh, another example of this. Uh, one of my favorite stories in this book is the story of the Utah, a University of Utah healthcare system, which was one of the most poorly ranked healthcare systems in the country in terms of patient satisfaction and happiness. And Laura Betts, who was the CEO at the time, 
encountered his own system and saw it dehumanizing when his wife had an unexpected attack of kidney stones, terribly painful by all accounts. And he took her to his hospital, one of his many hospitals. Um, it's the biggest healthcare system in the state. And she had a terrible dehumanizing experience. So much so that I stopped him and said, Lars, did they know who she was? Like the CEO's wife? And he goes, I was in the room, yes. And then he said to himself, you know, what I thought to myself on that day, what if some poor schmuck walked in here wasn't related to the CEO? What would that look like? So he set out to his great credit, he owned that, right? He didn't blame the nurse and the doctor that day. He said, this is my system. Like what, what's going on here? And he went down to the department that collects all the data on patient satisfaction. When he realized that they were giving all these averages, which masked the worst cases. So then he asked for those and he had a box of them he brought home and they were, they were terrible. So um, I described this in the book. He paid, uh, he, he reached out. He got a number of people who were willing to share their story, hired a high production video crew to interview them, didn't tell anyone. And then he brought his medical staff into an auditorium, closed the doors, turned on the lights and showed them the interviews, beautifully done, crying, keep weeping. And people saying, that's not us. And he's like, this is exactly us. So he went on a journey to really rehumanize the system. And they, they went from bottom of the heap to number one ranked healthcare system in the country. Year after year, there's a book about it called The Long Fix written by his successor, if you're interested. And he did a lot of things. But I said, Lars, in the end, what was the most important thing? Hmm. And he said, our patients just wanted to be seen. Right. They just wanted to know they mattered to their caregiver. And it's a relationship again. It is a relationship. It wasn't about their symptoms. It wasn't about like, does my doctor know me as a human being? And Jessica Brent, so the thing you said, I thought you were going to ask, you almost said it. Um, you said something about, um, you know, when we talk about sort of care of students yes. and we're very caring of students, that can easily fall into customer service thinking. Oh, yeah. And Jessica Benjamin talks about this idea of thirdness. It's not just me and a student. It's me and a student with a vision of a third state in which right in which we are both working. So it's not me as coach mentor filling this empty vessel with knowledge. It's not me saying, oh, Allison, how are you? I'm going to take a care of you. That's important. Right. But it's like, can Allison and I build a relationship that is different than her as student or me as teacher alone? So if you think of your great mentors, you enter into that sort of sense of thirdness. And Jessica, by the way, works with like, Israel and Palestine, like she does hard relationships, right? Um, and, and she would say, for example, that the polarization in America today is because we have lost our thirdness. That mm. sense of, look at, you and I may disagree, Allison, but at the end of the day, we're Americans who believe that we've got to do, you know, take care of people, blah, blah, blah. We don't, right. now what we say is you're not American. Right. And we have no shared sense of thirdness, right? Right. Yeah. So so when I think about that in very practical terms in education, like that's why the undergraduate research, we just had a group of students publish with a faculty member. And that's such a powerful thing because it wasn't teacher student. It was a third state of we are authors together producing research that's publishable. Right. That goes right? out to the world. Absolutely. And if you look at things on high impact practices, mm -hmm. That's like right on the top of the list among high impact practices because it's transforming. It is so transformative. And I was thinking about um, when you were describing mattering and you described it in a way that it made me think about a phrase that was shared with my boys who are 13 and 15 when they started school um, at our, our local school one of the objectives in kindergarten was to help them identify an adult they could trust at mm -hmm. school. And I will never forget my kindergarten, my, my oldest son, when he was in kindergarten and he came home at the end of the year and we're sort of talking about all the fun things you did in kindergarten and what was your favorite thing? And, you know, of course, recess and lunch. And then I said, what did, what did you learn this year? And he said to me at six, mom, I found an adult I can trust at school. Right? Yeah. yeah. That has stayed with him. That stayed with our family. And as I was reading your book, 
and reading the chapter on mattering, which was also my favorite chapter, I kept thinking back to this notion of like, who, who are the, whether they're adults or just the people in our life who we can trust um, and vice versa. Um, And I don't know that we, we collective, we have done a a great job of identifying, um, you know, who the, who those people are. Um, And so one thing that I want to, you know, we've talked about, we've talked about the challenges and opportunities at a systems level. We've even brought it, you brought it down to, you know, the Utah Medical Center. We've talked about it from an institutional standpoint with even at SNHU. What could each of us just like in our lives, like help what's the first step that we might take toward mattering? If we were to walk away from this talk in the next half hour, what's something we could do today to signal that we we matter or someone matters to us? Um, time. Mm. You can't shortchange time in the in the calculus of mattering. So in some ways, what I was trying to argue in the book is that there's an enormous place for technology and scaling but not at the expense of human relationships, but in order to create time for human relationships. And I was reading a research uh, project that had to do with friendship. And the argument was friendship requires true friendship, like the friendship that you're talking about, that I trust you to have my back friendship, requires two things. So one, it requires a level of vulnerability because when you are vulnerable with somebody else, what you're basically saying is I trust you, which triggers trust back. So it's a triggering mechanism. Wow, you shared that with me? And you've had this experience, Allison, right? It could be with colleagues. It's maybe people that aren't even in the category of friend yet. But for some reason, you shared a vulnerability. And the next thing you know, they're sharing something they weren't sharing before. And then the second one was time. Like, you have to put in the time. And I think, um, God, I have fallen into this trap because, like you, we all have very, very busy lives. And I sometimes think that writing the check is the meaningful thing. Right? Right? But the thing that is meaningful is the human connection. I just had this viscerally, um, it was very powerful. I hope you don't mind my sharing this. Uh, my wife and I were coming out of a restaurant the other day in Manchester, New Hampshire. It's not a big city, but it has issues of homelessness like so many cities do today. And this woman came to us and it was snow on the ground. It was snowing. It was a beautiful night, the way cities are beautiful in the snow. And you know that kind of muffled quiet that you get. Uh, before the streets have been plowed. And this woman walked up to us in sort of thin coat and shoes and very thin and may have been an addict and asked for money and she was hungry. And I reached my pocket and first thing I pulled up was a 20, I gave her $20. And she wanted, to, you could tell like she was hungry for the engagement for a moment. We were asked like, where are you staying tonight? Where, you know, I sleep in my car, blah, blah, blah. Have you tried the shelter? And we were involved with social stuff here. I was like, have you talked to so-and-so? She didn't, doesn't trust the shelter, doesn't feel safe there. And then um, without, my wife just sort of reached out and put her arms around her and hugged her. Oh. She just stayed in the embrace. Right. And my wife was like, didn't say, do you need a hug? Didn't wait. She didn't say, we, and it was just an incredibly human moment. And honestly, she most of the people I know would hand over the cash, but few would hug a stranger who might, who, you know, honestly, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to be delicate, but like, Right. Right. They may not know uh, their background or their situation or right. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and I thought, you know, again and again, like uh, I describe in the book where we had a student that um, an alumni who was a principal, a noted principal, now retired in Manchester, came to see me about this girl who was a ward of the state. I mean, she had every bad thing that can happen almost happen to you. And we gave her everything, right? Tuition, room board, books, clothing budget. We paid for everything at his behest and request. Mm-hmm. Um, and we thought, I thought we had done the hard work mm-hmm. and she didn't last because what she didn't find with us was relationship, the time to feel like you matter. Right. Um, and it was just, you know, it was a hard lesson for me. I still bear her, the scar mm-hmm. tissue of that, um, and think about, you know, I think so often what happens, for example, and so, you know, prestige, selective schools, they think writing the check is the hot, is the work. And it's not. And Greg did really great work at Brown demonstrating through really, you know, solid methodological reasons, the ways in which first generation students, we get all of this incredible scholar, scholarship support, no, no debt, right? No student loan debt when they leave Brown. Right. And yet, 
be made to feel every day like they didn't matter to the place, like they didn't belong there. Yes. It's not belonging. Mattering is more powerful than belonging. You and I belong to associations. I don't know that they mat that I matter to them. They want my check every year. Mattering is like, no, you know me. Greg would say mattering requires three things that you that you see me. You know, we've all had that experience of meeting someone and like, wow, they really get me. Like, you know that expression, they really get me. Yes. What they what you mean is that they go beyond the label. Right. Um, and then the second thing is that you invest in someone. So for lots of our friends, it's investment of time. It can be like, oh, I came over and baked you a lasagna because you haven't been well, but that's time, right? Um, and then the third, and this is that sort of, it touches on Jessica Benjamin's work about thirdness in relationship, is that I that you I allow you to have impact. So like if you do an employee program, I say, look, at, I'm going to uh, recognize my LGBTQ plus, TQ plus employees, right. and I'm going to do a bunch of things that made them feel seen. They will love that. Right. right. They'll feel like I matter to this place. Look what they're doing. If I then invest in them mm -hmm. in those ways that matter to them, that validates. It means, oh, it's not just talk, it's real. But if I really want them to feel powerful, I let them I let them have impact. I let them change the way we operate. Right. Uh, and then you feel like you matter. Oh my gosh. Sorry, that felt very preachy and like I was going off in love field. <laughs> so many good nuggets. And you and I actually, before we we uh, came live with everyone, we were talking about the power of letter writing and maybe the lost mm. art of letter writing. Um, and I remember, you know, over the course of the last year, I could name the people who sent me a handwritten letter and there's less than 10, but I remember all of them. And to the point that we were making before uh, the book talk started, the time that someone took yeah. to sit down and write a letter for me last year was life changing, life changing yeah. to receive that in the mail. I'll give you a wonderful little example. You and I have been to probably endless numbers of weddings, and I went to one of a young friend two weeks ago with my wife and my kids, and Allison was the honorary daughter in our family, brilliant young woman, and. Uh, probably 120 people at the wedding. And when you sat down, there was a place, well, it looked like a place card, but it was actually an envelope. And in every one was a handwritten note, not just five lines, thank you so much for being here, but a very detailed one that evoked the things that made you realize, wow, she, like, she remembered that or she valued this in a way. And I've been to a lot of weddings and you say, oh, really nice. Food better than I thought. Not rubber chicken, beautiful right. flowers. Oh, great music and great DJ. Everyone talked about the letter. Yes. Everyone had their own and everyone talked about it. it. Took her a lot of time. Absolutely. But it was more than it was the time and it was that sense of connectedness that was so powerful. I always say about events, whether wedding or a conference, do not fuss over the font on the napkins. Like, <laughs> people want to remember the way they felt when they were there and together yeah. and connected. Um so that it, when you said that, that, I mean, that letter is such a powerful gift and that yeah. gift of time is incredibly powerful. That actually, it, it allows me to pivot to a question sure. um, that was asked in the chat. So Danny Meadows, um, he said he was just still contemplating your question about whether students will ever matter to colleges again, um, if they ever did. And so to what extent do you think this is an issue of faculty caring about other things more um, maybe faculty being incentivized to care about things more or sure. perhaps just overwhelmed um, and, and exhausted. Yep. So a wonderful question. I think you nailed it. So in the book, one of the things I point out is that in every instance where I interviewed an innovator doing really good work and rethinking systems and making space for relationships, they had to change the incentive structures the reward and recognition structures of the system because you will get the behavior you design for. So in Laura's case, in the healthcare system, in a fee for service, I make more money, my system makes more money. The more patients I see, the more lab tests I order, the more x-rays that are needed, the more scans, the more therapists, et cetera, et cetera. And I need to go fast mm -hmm. and can't shortchange time. Right. So when you start to change incentive and say, actually, 
we're going to incent more of your bonus, more of your end of the year sort of rewards mm -hmm. based on how patients feel about the care you give. And, the, and you know this research, right, Allison? Like when people feel like they have a relationship with their physician, the likelihood of them suing for malpractice goes down even when the doctor screwed up. Right. And the response is, oh, no, I have a relationship with Dr. Griffin. Like, no, no, she, she didn't do that on purpose, right? So, Allison, what's the average amount of time that an American physician goes out, listens to a patient before they stop them by interrupting them? 30 seconds. Yeah, it's very generous. It's six. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, this is an NPR report earlier this year, six seconds. And go think back to Laura says, I want them to know me. How can you know someone if you're not listening ever? So, so I think... Um, when we think about, I, I have two daughters who are kind of in the world of American academia. And so I always say to my youngest, who's, um, I won't say where they are, uh, what I'll just say is I said, like, you know, if she throws herself into the life of her students um, and knows them and spends the time with them, it's only so many hours in the day. So, and doesn't publish the requisite number of articles and get her first book done and sit on X number of committees and spend time brown nosing the right dean um, or department chair. Great for our students, great for the relationships that will transform lives. They may remember for the rest of their lives. She's not getting tenure, not getting promoted. Right. Right. So the incentive systems, and then you layer on, remember what I said, we do this to our own advisors. You layer on all this other stuff that isn't really about the work. Right. And then of course, we're shortchanging those students. So the institutions, in my view, that kind of get this right uh, are ones that have coaching at their heart, like an SNHU does a lot of this, but there are others. Uh, I think small liberal arts colleges, when they've been at their best, mm -hmm. small works because you actually get to know your faculty member. Now look at small residential education is not solving for our scale challenges in the US, but for the students who are lucky enough to get it, pretty transformative, right? Those are the relationships I had. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Whether residential truly on campus or being part of a community, again, that exactly. showed you that you mattered. Yeah. Um, yeah, were, and students in big universities don't often get it from their faculty, but they will often get it from others. So it always doesn't have to be a faculty member. There's a healthcare system, a co-op, and I think it's Argentina that has very, very successful results. But um, it's not because they made a lot more time available with clinicians. Mm -hmm. They have healthcare coaches that literally go to every patient's house every month. They they see you holistically. They can look around and kind of see what the state of your home is. Right. Um, right? right. And and as a result of that, it's incredible care and patients do much better. So yes. I think for, in, to go back to the question, you know, in large universities, students will often find the meaningful relationship that helps transform them through a coach. Uh, an advisor to a group who may not be a faculty member, right? So affinity groups are very strong, each other, um, right? Teams, like if you take a look at graduation rates among students, you know, when they belong to a team, when they belong to a student organization, uh, right. work, uh, uh, work supervisors. Sure. Oh. Um, I just recorded a message for our student employee dinner and you know, oftentimes students will cite their uh, work study supervisor as the person who really took care of, who, you know, brought them home for dinner, who right. checked on them when they had a cold and didn't show up for work. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. And it is all based in that relationship. Based in a relationship. Thousands someone who's like, someone cares for me, knows me. Right. Yeah. So a looming question for me, I have this question, but I also saw that Sebra Graves asked it in the Q&A. The role of technology in addressing some of these challenges. So, um, you know, the you know, I know the the role of technology more uh, specifically or a little bit better at the intersection of education and employment. You know, as a way to perhaps expedite or better connect um, learners. But it seems like there are so many emerging technologies, and now with the you know. Uh, I mean, can't I can't have a conversation without talking about it? You know, AI chatbot, right? But um, this idea of can we leverage technology as a way to help build, restore, fix, 
uh, a band-aid. I mean, I don't know what the right term is. Um, some of the missteps that we have had in um, in our social systems. Yeah, absolutely. I think absolutely. So we we use a lot of technology. We deploy enormous amounts of technology and data and data analytics. But we often say, no, we do it in service of the human relationship. So when advisors um, are coming in in the morning uh, and log into the system, they'll see flagged those students in their portfolio, their case, if you will, who um, have been identified for some reason as at risk or they should check on. So it's a proactive advising model in which the analytics drive that day's to-do list. Because obviously, you know, as students proceed, um, they just get more, they need less and less hand-holding. And then it's really just a relationship of checking in. Allison, how's everything? Oh, it's going great. Blah, blah, blah. And, you know, so, but students in the beginning are very fragile, are non-traditional students, right? And and they we are watching closely 24-7. It's not just things like, are they logging in, but predictive analytics, that they perform as well? And sometimes, you know, I call you because you've logged in. It's like, hey, Allison, uh, looks like that stats exam gave you a run for your money. And you might say, oh, God, week from hell. Both my kids were sick. My boss is being a jerk. I had to get this project done that you didn't tell me about, blah, blah, blah. I'll get back on track. I already reached out to the professor. She said I can do extra credit. And I'm like, great. You need anything? Nope, got to run. Yep. Yeah. You might say, oh, what was I thinking about coming back to college? Jesus, I'm too busy. My kids have been driving me nuts. I don't know if I can do this work. Stats is kicking my butt. I was never, you know, I failed when I took it 10 years ago at community college. That's when I need the human relationship. That's when I need the intervention, right? So the technology is giving me the early warning. It can give me the insights to fuel the human relationship that makes a difference. I think that um, we're now having, like everyone in higher ed, talking a lot about AI, chat GPT, we're all playing with it. And I think it's profound in lots of ways. So one is we've been using a chatbot that uh, integrated into our processes and courses, and we are seeing uh, pretty significant increases in persistence. We ran A-B testing, and it was so good that we stopped the testing and said, let's just deploy this across the board, because we're seeing real persistence challenges right now with the people we serve, right? They were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. We have frontline workers, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there's a use of technology, again, AI-based or machine learning-based. But I think this bigger question, and there are a couple of questions I'm really spending a lot of time grappling with. I interviewed George Siemens for an all-hands meeting. So George is one of the great leaders in AI. And I asked him the question, I said, George, I promise I wasn't going to ask you this, but now I'm going to ask you this. Sentience. You know, does it like, is it, is that really where we're heading? And he said, well, hugely complicated question. A, we still uh, struggle to define it. But he said, the profound thing says, but does it matter if it feels like it? Yeah. And I wonder about what happens when we can have relationships with machines that feel and have the impact of human relationships. You know, the way that Japanese are using robots with isolated elderly people, yes. it actually impacts them. It yeah. actually has the results that you might get if it was a real human being. So that's an interesting thing we're going to have to sort through. Mm -hmm. But I think the other thing that's interesting is um, in a world where more and more knowledge is sort of at your fingertip, not in the way of a Google search, which basically gives you a list of knowledge, but actually generative knowledge that feels like you can know a thing. Mm -hmm. We know that um, so much of higher ed is built on the transmission of knowledge. We know that's been for a long time a faulty notion. We really want to think about what people can do with what they know. But now when all that knowledge is here, how do we have to rethink knowledge? And does what become what becomes really useful and valuable and powerful is actually distinctly human abilities and traits. So the technology um, superpowers, supercharges our, our knowledge holding, our knowledge access. But we have to raise our cognitive level to ask better questions. Like, how do I know what knowledge to ask for? What, how do I judge the knowledge that I'm getting back? How do I know this is good or not good? Right. And then secondly, when that AI can increasingly replace um, a lot of knowledge work, what become, what's the work that's left? What's the work that feels important? And I think it's going to be distinctly grounded in human qualities that machines don't do so well. 
Right. And yet those are the very jobs we tend to value least in our society. Right. So I just, I married a couple of your thoughts as you were uh, responding to that question. You shared the anecdote about robots and uh, uh, elderly Japanese individuals. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, but is that robot? Yeah, I'm thinking back too to the story you shared about you and your wife walking down the snowy street. Yeah. Robot hug that elderly person who might be at home alone, right? That element of like true connection and, and touch. And then I think about um, just to your point again, and I'll bring up the anecdote of my my own son, you know, 15, very um, maybe a, uh, 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 has a hard time focusing and but wants to be a doctor, like mm. wants to be a doctor more than anything in his life. And I keep thinking about all the machines that will come in and be able to do so many of the things that people do now, right? Whether yeah. they're already yeah. doing or they will in the next 20 years as he yeah. gets older. But I also think about how empathetic he is and how um, emotionally intelligent he is. And I'm like, the thing that people will need most from you is the fact that you will care about them. Let mm -hmm. the, you know, let the machine like do, do the work. You do the work of the of building that connection. And so I feel like there is, there's such a place. There's a, there's a, a necessity um, for both. Um, yeah. An example I sometimes use it sort of echoes what you're saying, Allison, is like, we will increasingly get to a place where algorithms are better and better and better at making a diagnosis. And God forbid you get, a, you know, a, a dire, dire, grave diagnosis of cancer. Um, you may want the accuracy of the machine and all of the depths of knowledge that will come with that. Um, you know, your genome type, what kinds of treatments, like everything will be faster and more accurate, more powerful. Um, but you don't want a machine holding your hand saying, you'll, you'll be okay. We'll get through this together. Machine yeah. can't do that. You know, and the person who does that today is a hospital social worker, the lowest paid person on the sort of food chain. And will we start to flip those relationships? You know, I don't think we worry a lot about putting our children in the hands of early childhood ed educators for how much they will know at the end of a year, mm -hmm. but how much they are loved and feel nurtured and, and are socialized, right? That's not machine stuff. Um, and yet early childhood educators, the lowest paid people on the educational ladder. Yes. Um, so there's a, I, I think, you know, there's going to, I'm in the camp that thinks there's going to be an enormous displacement of human jobs mm -hmm. and that they're not going to be replaced as other, as they were in other paradigm shifts by equal and more new jobs. I don't think that's true. I actually think this is the first time where the new jobs will also be done increasingly by the machines. By the machines. Um, so I argue that on the other hand, there is an enormous need of distinctly human jobs mm -hmm. that are efficient systems of care don't want to pay for and we need them desperately like we don't have a mental health system in this country at a time of absolute full-out burning platform mental health issues we should we should flood our society with mental health workers and counselors and professionals machines aren't going to do that we um we need and de -stigmatize, more not to interrupt and, but and yeah. destigmatize the opportunity that we create for people to seek the help that they need um, absolutely absolutely and systems of care yeah. often are tied to stigmatization of one kind or another to so admit that you're not healthy physically healthy you know we're still a kind of calvinist thing in our country where like well you must not be taking care of yourself um or you know and there are very variations of this and certainly criminal justice substance abuse and you know and in some ways even k-12 and higher education the way we make students feel about the places that they get into or that they attend Right. I mean, you know that there is a comedy made about community colleges, which educate 50 percent of all American students. Um, yeah. So, yeah, totally agree. Sorry, I'm going to talk about. Before. Well, we again, you know, in our in our house. And then I think, you know, I serve as um, a trustee. I serve as the chair of the board at a public institution here in Colorado. And the way that we you know, talk to the opportunity with both you know, my kids at home and our, our learners at the institution is you, know, you are building relationships and connections 
um, in your lifelong learning journey. And this is, you know, this is a place, this is a, a stop on the pathway. It's not the end point. It's, um, it's a, a stopping point um, on your journey. And uh, yeah, that, that desire for learning beyond high school, like that is, that's a lifelong pursuit. Um, and so being able to recognize that. That's what yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it's true. And someone asked this question about, you know, the power of the, iPhones, and I think, you know, what we are learning uh, is the degree to which the technology has outraced our societal ability to um, handle that technology, to frame that technology and manage it in ways that are good for the health of our children, teenagers, and people generally. And and I know George is on this. I mentioned George, I just saw he's in the Q&A. You should be talking to George on this topic, not me. <laughs> But I do think, you know, I asked George the question, I said, you know, um, when we think about how we move forward, uh, what we both agree on is we don't have enough philosophers, we don't have enough ethicists, we don't have enough psychologists in the AI discussion right now. Um, and I've been listening to all of the podcasts you've been listening to, and they're fabulous. And look at so much of the work is being driven by exceedingly smart people, but I don't want a bunch of tech bros to drive the way technologists knew, and I think this is equivalent to the like, invention of electricity. I think this is the order of magnitude that November 1st, 2022 will hold when chat GPT was made available to the public. Um, you know, but if I look at our track record, I'm not looking to Zuckerberg, Musk, uh, Dorsey as people who have helped shape the society in generally good ways. Brilliant business people, brilliant technologists, but, but tech, but this is happening faster than our ability to make sense of it and guide it. Um, and that's an important place for universities to, to play a role. Mm -hmm. So we have a couple minutes left and I want to leave us on a high note. Hmm. You've left, you've given us a lot of great, um, great inspirations um, and great uh, takeaways to think about, but what, gives you the greatest amount of hope, both coming off writing this book and doing the research you did, but also as you look toward the future, what gives you hope? Yeah, so it's funny because I remember like, God, that title sounds too depressing. I don't want to read this book. It's like, and then I was who read it said, it's actually a very optimistic book. And it really is because A, um, it I, I've, I've met all these people who are doing it. Like they're, you know, Alexander Packard, or Xander Packard, as he goes by, who created Iora Health. And, you know, this is one that's based on relationships. Does it scale? Well, Amazon just acquired it. So I would say they don't do that very much. It isn't scalable. We'll see if they keep it intact. But, right. So we know how to do this. Mm -hmm. And we know how to do this because it draws upon the most powerful tool every one of us walks around with, which is the ability to love. Like we have it. We don't have to invent a technology. We don't have to invent a new way of being in the world. We know that this is a thing. And it was, I said that, like, you know, do you remember Leo Biscali from the 70s, like the love doctor? But it was the last chapter of the book is about, I use the word, I use the L word, not leadership. I use the word love. But no, Frances Frey uses the word love when she talks about in her book Unleashed about how they went into Uber and rebuilt that culture uh, that was so desperately broken. And I think, um, and, and obviously I mean love, in terms of our care, our time, our connection with people, I believe that. And the number of letters and emails and notes I've gotten from people who are burned out teachers, burned out social workers, burned out workers in the court system who have said, you, you've captured what's wrong. Like, mm -hmm. I want to love again. Like, I want to take good care of the kids in my classroom. And uh, I was did a book talk in England recently uh, by Zoom. I wish it was in England. Oh. And the reporter, Jenny Anderson, who's wonderful. She did it for a podcast. She used to work for the New York Times, right for the New York Times, said, you know, when she talked about this message with teachers in the British K-12 system, they scoffed. And what they said was, are you kidding? I have lunch duty. I have transport, they call it transportation duty. Beginning, of it, we would say bus duty. I have to fill out these forms. I have to submit these lesson plans. I have to be on this committee. I have to do these assessments. 
and you want me to find extra time to know all my students as p individual people, like that ain't happening. And I would say that I'm absolutely right. Because if we can automate and scale and bring technology to all this stuff that actually doesn't make kids better, then right. I will buy you. Remember time? You can't shortchange. I will buy you the time with your students that you need. Absolutely. And that's a system design question, Allison. So we've got the most powerful tool we need. We know that it was a Deming who said, you know, you get the outcomes to what you design for. So if you design a system that leaves teachers no time to really know their kids, guess what's going to happen? That's a system that they got. So I think we can do this. And I met tons of people who are doing it. And I think um, now's the time because I do think people, so many people feel, I shouldn't overgeneralize, but I'm going to project and generalize, which it feels like our systems are broken. Yes. It feels like it. And I think people are hungry to get it right. Well, Paul, thank you oh, so thank much. You, Allison. That was amazing. Thank you for spending um, a good hour with us in, in the right conversation. I would encourage um, all of you who have joined us, not just to pick up a copy of Paul's book, um, but go to your local bookseller and buy two copies and give one <laughs> to someone. Thank you, Allison. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm a big fan of local bookstores, and I am mm -hmm. also a big fan of handing a book uh, to someone that you care about very much. So um, I would encourage everyone who joined us today to do that uh, as your week comes to a close. Thank, Thank you, you so for much. joining us, and we look forward to working with you again. Thank you, Allison. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care.